Mr. President, after 36 years as a member of the United States Senate, this is likely my last opportunity to address its members as colleagues and to address the people of my state as constituents and to thank them for placing their trust in me. The highest honor any citizen of a democracy can receive is to be elected to represent his or her fellow Americans, to be their fiduciary. The Senate staff, including the floor staff, the Capitol Police, and those throughout the Capitol complex who work so hard to keep things here moving, thank you for your service and support for us through the long days and nights. To my staff, thank you for your strong loyalty to the people of Michigan, to our nation, and to me. And thank you for believing in public service. I'm immensely proud of what the men and women who have worked on my staff for the last 36 years have helped accomplish. My staff back in Michigan has helped make communities across our state safer and more prosperous, and countless times they have helped individual constituents resolve an issue, making a real difference in thousands of lives. The Armed Services Committee and Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation staffs PSI staffs have worked tirelessly through long hours and complex issues, sacrificing nights and weekends and vacations to help address the pressing issues of our nation. And my personal office staff has been instrumental in addressing a breathtaking range of issues, from preserving our American auto industry to making our tax system fairer to protecting our irreplaceable Great Lakes, to making medicine available to fight addiction, and much, much more. As to my mentor, my big brother Sandy, Congress is keeping the better half of Team Levin when I retire to Michigan while Sandy remains in Congress. To Barbara, my wife of 53 years, <clears throat> To our three daughters, Kate, Laura, and Erica, to their husbands, Howard, Daniel, and Rick, and to our six grandchildren, Bess and Samantha Markell, Noah and Ben Levine, and Beatrice and Olivia Fernandez, thank you for your love and support, which has meant so much to me. Now, I've been asked many times if I'm leaving the Senate out of frustration with gridlock, and the answer is no. My family and friends and those of you with whom I serve know how much I love the Senate and that I'll love my work until my last day here and that I will leave here with unabashed confidence in the Senate's ability to weather storms and to meet the nation's needs. I know firsthand the challenges before this Senate. And I believe that one of the greatest is the need to meet the fundamental economic challenge of this era, the growing gap in our society between a fortunate few and the vast majority of Americans whose, whose fortunes have stagnated or fallen. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I believe that the economists who tell us that this inequality is holding back economic growth are right. This isn't just about economic data. It's about our nation's heart and soul. This growing gulf between a fortunate few and a struggling many is a threat to the dream that has animated this nation since its founding, the dream that hard work leads to a better life for us and for our children. To restore the connection between hard work and greater opportunity, I hope the next Congress will act on many fronts, strengthening education and worker training programs, making greater investments in infrastructure and research that foster growth. And as I've said here many times, it should pay for these needed investments by closing egregious tax loopholes that serve no economic purpose, but enrich some of the wealthiest among us in our most profitable corporations. Many foresee a continuation of polarization and partisanship in the Senate, 
and say that it's naive to suggest that the next Congress might come together, break out of gridlock, and accomplish great things. But I know the Senate can do better because I've seen it happen with my own eyes. The Senate has indeed demonstrated, even in our own era, that bipartisanship is not extinct. The Senate Armed Services Committee has upheld a more than 50-year tradition of bipartisan cooperation to produce an annual Defense Authorization Act that advances the security of our nation. I'm grateful to the members of the U.S. military and their families for their selfless sense of duty. But I'm also grateful for the way that they have inspired us year after year to come together across lines of party and ideology to support them. They not only protect us, they unite us. Congress has come together over the years to make improvements in pay, benefits, and health care for the men and women of the military, to reform the way in which we buy the weapons they use to carry out their missions, to adopt policies to protect them from sexual assault, and to provide improved education benefits through the modern GI Bill, and reform the way in which we care for our wounded warriors. We are training and equipping the militaries of nations under assault by extremists and religious fanatics so that those nations can depend more on themselves for their own security and less on America's sons and daughters. We have passed the defense authorization bill to accomplish these things each year for more than half a century by laying aside partisan differences for the common good. We have never allowed disagreements over policy to interfere with our duty to our troops and their families. And I'm deeply grateful to the many ranking Republican partners that I've been fortunate to work with in that endeavor. People like John McCain and John Warner and Jim Inhofe. John McCain, my great friend, who has demonstrated extraordinary courage in war and in this Senate, will take the gavel of the Armed Services Committee. And my trusted wingman and friend, Jack Reed, will become ranking member. At a pivotal moment for the Senate and for this nation, the Armed Services Committee will be in strong hands. I've seen firsthand additional powerful evidence that the Senate can work together to meet the Senate, to meet the nation's needs. And that is in the work of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, PSI, which I've been privileged to chair for 10 years, working with Republican partners, and I use the term partners advisedly, such as Tom Coburn and John McCain and Susan Collins. Our subcommittee has exposed the tax avoidance schemes of some of the most powerful corporations and wealthiest individuals. We have shined a light on abusive credit card practices. We've investigated wasteful and ineffective government programs. We have confronted market manipulators and exposed conflicts of interest, mortgage fraud, and reckless schemes by some of the most powerful banks, schemes aided by some of the largest accounting and law firms. We've demonstrated how those activities help bring our economy to its knees destroying jobs, reducing the value of our homes, and damaging our neighborhoods. The work of PSI has helped lead to reforms that have strengthened our financial system and reduced credit card abuses. The power of PSI lies in the in-depth work of our staffs and in the willingness to confront powerful and entrenched interests. Like the Senate Armed Services Committee, PSI is strengthened by a dedication to bipartisanship and a respect for the rights of the Senate minority. We have recognized the danger of using investigative power for partisan or political purposes. And we have ensured that our great staffs, majority and minority, participate together in every investigation. 
Indeed, it is protection of the minority that is the singular hallmark of the United States Senate. The majority cannot always have its way. The Senate is more than just the place where the hot tea is cooled in the deliberative saucer that President Washington famously spoke of. Protections for the minority make the Senate more than just a place to slow things down. Those protections make it a place where we work things out. It is those protections that force compromise that is essential to unifying and governing our country. Making progress in the Senate require solutions that, while they may not provide anyone with everything they want, are broadly accepted as in the common interest. When compromise is thwarted by ideological rigidity or by abuse of the rights that our rules afford us, the Senate can become paralyzed, unable to achieve the lofty tasks that the founders set before us. Polarization is exacerbated by forces outside this chamber. For instance, we seem to make news more often these days by our responses in the corridors outside this chamber to reporters questioning us about the latest breaking story or rumor than we do by debating and legislating inside this chamber. The viral nature of information and disinformation and the expectation that public officials will be immediately responsive to every news flash with but a few th seconds to think through the implications or consequences or pros and cons has led too often to less thoughtful discourse. And that has helped drive rhetorical wedges between us. The incoming Senate has an opportunity to restore a greater measure of bipartisan compromise by revisiting one of the most contentious issues that we face, one that we struggled with at the beginning of this Congress, and that's the Senate rules. I believe the excessive use of the filibuster to obstruct confirmation of President Obama's nominees was damaging to the Senate and to the nation. Any president. Democrat or Republican, should have the ability to choose his or her team. But the Senate majority eliminated obstructions to presidential nomina nominations through the use of the nuclear option, effectively accomplishing a rules change outside the rules, a method I could not support. In doing so, a precedent was established that the majority could effectively change the rules as it wished by overruling the chair and the parliamentarian. That precedent will not serve the country well in the future because it leaves the minority with no protection, diminishing the unique role of the United States Senate. I hope the Senate next year considers reversing that precedent while simultaneously, and I emphasize simultaneously, amending the rules so as to assure a president's ability to fulfill his or her constitutional duties. Put simply, I believe the Senate should do the right thing in the right way. It should amend the Senate rules as provided for in the rules to adopt the substance of the changes that we made last year. I know my good friend, Senator Lamar Alexander, who was a part of a bipartisan group of eight who worked closely and successfully together on this issue in 2012, has proposed something similar. Such action by the Senate next year would be a welcome victory for comedy and for compromise. And it would, I hope, represent a step back from a precedent that leads to effective rules changes by simple majority. 
it would be a step towards a better functioning Senate. No leader alone, no single senator, neither party by itself can determine the Senate's course. <clears throat> together, acting together, the members of this body can move the Senate forward, and in doing so, help move forward the nation that we all love. I will enjoy reading about the Senate's progress in the years ahead. As Barbara and I are sitting on a Lake Michigan beach or showing the world to our grandkids. I thank the chair, I thank my dear friends, the, the leaders of this body, and see my brother sitting here. And I'm not allowed to refer to my family in the gallery, so I won't do that. <laughs> Thank you.